Whether you woke up this morning happy with what happened in the elections or sad, I woke up just thinking this is another time when we have to think about the strategy to advance religious freedom. It's not safe in the hands of either party alone, but it's safe in God's hands. So whatever happened, we can trust that God is powerful to make certain his good purposes, to make those be fulfilled. And whatever party is up or down, we have to ask them to help us to live civilly, drawing together, and if we don't draw together, nevertheless, to live in mutual, mutual respect. And that's my topic this morning, to talk about religious freedom. And I want to be a contrarian, at least for some of you, Instead of joining with those who say that religious freedom is harmful, I will claim that it's a vital freedom, vital for you and Biola, for people and organizations of other faiths, and I want to persuade you even to become an ambassador for religious freedom, persuading others also to value it and protect it. Religious freedom is an important freedom because it protects people and organizations that are out of step with a popular majority in society and out of step with the laws that enforce that majority view. I don't think you should be surprised if you discover that what you believe to be right and true is out of step with our society. Often following Jesus will lead us in a different way than the crowd. And it isn't just you and other Christians. Every community of faith will sometimes find itself out of step with the majority about some important belief or practice, and therefore we all need religious freedom. Religious freedom, I concede, is full of difficult questions. How far should it extend? What it should protect? But the first thing to do is to get the main point right. So that's what I want to focus on, the main point about religious freedom. And I'll start with a personal story. I was born on the mission field in Japan. I actually went to Japanese public school. That was an event. I spent my early years in Japan and then in rural Northern California, that's the other California, and I mean rural. Our town had no gas station, no supermarket, no traffic lights. Farmers would stop in the middle of the freeway, uh, highway to talk to each other. So that's small, and yet I ended up working in the President George W. Bush White House. What a surprise that was. I was asked to work for President Bush to help him put into practice some new federal religious freedom ideas. As you might know, the federal government and also state, county, and city governments, when they decide to operate a program to help kids who need an adoptive family, to supply low-income housing, or food assistance, when government decides to do these things, it normally turns to private organizations and pays them to provide the services. After all, those organizations like Salvation Army or the AME Church or a secular job training program or a Muslim or Jewish charity have already been providing those services to their neighbors. By paying them, the government gets their expertise. But for a long time, 70s, 80s, 90s and so on, religious charities were excluded from government funding. This was due to a mistaken interpretation of the First Amendment. I was pleased to work for President Bush to help create new policies and attitudes in the federal government so that religious charities that do good work have an equal chance with secular charities to win government funding. So my work helped evangelical Christian groups and also Orthodox Jewish groups and Muslim organizations and Catholic schools and hospitals and also secular organizations. And when President Obama was elected and continued that faith-based effort, I was proud to be asked to be an advisor to his White House officials who carried on the work that I had helped to start. And now, in the Trump administration, where a similar effort's going forth, but in a unique way, as you might guess, I have joined with people from the Obama years to provide guidance and support to the Trump officials they sit in office, they do the things they do, we want them to do the right things, and so we're helping them to do that. But I tell you this little story for three reasons. First of all, don't feel that you'll never be called to do unexpectedly prominent things just because you come from some out-of-the-way place, like rural Northern California, 
or for that matter, from Southern California. Second, religious freedom is authentically about protecting the religious rights of all, of all religions, all philosophical convictions. It is not just religious freedom for those who think like me. And third, I tell you this story to remind you that religious freedom covers many topics. It's not just about views on same-sex marriage and abortion. It isn't just about, as my colleague says, birth control, babies, and bathrooms. It has to do with the interface between different religious traditions and our society. And people are often in different places and religious freedom protects them. Religious freedom is a freedom that every person and organization needs in our very complicated and diverse society. We're diverse in many ways, including in our beliefs and practices. And so uniform laws, that's the kind of thing government likes to do, uniform laws will often clash with some or many people, with some or many organizations. And I say, where possible, we should give those persons and organizations the freedom to be true to their convictions. We should give them religious freedom, protection from a law's contrary requirements. That's been the American heritage. It's under pressure these days because we're more diverse and more complicated. But doesn't religious freedom protect bigotry? Well, this can happen, but I say mainly religious freedom protects difference. And difference is not always or even usually bigotry. It's just a different conviction about what is important and how to do that thing. We'll come back to this in a few minutes. But at this point, let me just say this. It is right for us to be concerned about bigotry and hate, of course, and we can't neglect it. So I want to frame my comments, the rest of my comments this morning by what Jesus taught us are the two great commandments. And you'll recall that story, I hope. Uh, I'll use a version found in the book of Matthew, chapter 22. Jesus was asked, which of the commandments is the greatest, the most important? It's kind of like, what are the one I have to do and maybe I don't have to follow the rest. Which commandments have to be, we be careful to obey? And Jesus said, you'll remember, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So two great commandments. I guess you don't have to memorize even 10. So two great commandments, two rules that sum up the intent of all the many other divine rules for how we should live to please God and to fulfill his good purposes in his world. Just two great commandments. Love God totally with all of your capabilities and intentions and energy, your education, your skills, and love your neighbor, the person next to you, the person unlike you, the person who needs your love. Love that person as you love yourself, as you wish to be treated, as you wish to be cherished and served. So two great commandments, love God entirely, love your neighbor as yourself. What do these two great commandments mean for religious freedom? Well, surely they mean at least that whatever religious freedom we claim must not lead to harm to our neighbors. We could hardly be loving our neighbors as ourselves, the second great commandment, if we are harming them. So I'll come back to this in a moment. Let's start though with what the two great commandments mean for you and this place for you and Biola. Here's what Biola University says about itself if you've not visited the website lately. Biola, quote, prepares students to think biblically about everything. And Biola offers biblically centered education, intentional spiritual development, and vocational preparation within a unique learning community where all faculty, staff, and students are professing Christians. This mission, this intentional community, has been the Biola mission and goal for more than a century. Let me put that Biola mission and those Biola statements into other words. Biola is dedicated to helping you to understand and then to live by those two great commandments. Love God wholly and love your neighbor as yourself. 
But now put on your thinking cap or ask Google or Alexa, is this Bible mission shared by UCLA, by USC, by Hollywood, by the state government in Sacramento? So isn't the answer obvious? They are all inspired by many convictions, but not exactly those convictions. I don't mean to condemn these places. They have their own views. Some of them try to serve everybody, but they're not explicitly trying to follow Jesus. And as I said, I don't want to condemn them. Uh, I'm actually a proud graduate of two secular institutions, the University of California at Davis, go Aggies, and the University of Toronto, go whatever they were. <laughs> uh, we had a really lousy football team and so on, so I don't know what the mascot was. But I received an excellent education at both places. But it was certainly not an education that integrated faith and learning. These were not learning communities comprised of professing Christians, and they didn't want to be. We evangelical Christians were just a small minority, and we had to find our own spiritual guidance and discover alternative teachers and authors who did take the Bible and Jesus seriously. Well, given vast differences of intention and belief, we should not be surprised when we discover that some conviction that we are certain God calls us to turns out not to be the popular choice in society or in many institutions. So sometimes we have to be counter-cultural. We have to be counter-cultural for the sake of loving God with our hearts and minds and so that we can love our neighbors as we wish to be loved in a way that's true to God's wisdom about the world and life. So be courageous, follow Jesus even when the crowd is going in a different direction. And in this friction with society, we can rightly ask the government to protect our religious freedom, to give us the right to follow Jesus and, not the, and, society, and not society. That's what religious freedom is, the freedom to remain true to your deep convictions when following the law would require you to violate those convictions. It's a freedom that you and I need sometimes, and so do others in our complicated, diverse society, since our laws cannot possibly take into account all the different convictions that we have. Now, let me talk to you about two complications, though, of religious freedom that we shouldn't ignore. The first complication concerns Biola University and other places like it, that is, religious freedom for organizations and not just for persons. But why would religious freedom even be needed by organizations? After all, they can't worship and they don't have an immortal soul. But organizations are created to accomplish important things that cannot be done on an informal basis by just temporarily calling a few people together and trying to do those things in a particular kind of way. You know, you could go to your favorite professor's home and learn a lot about your major if she would let you come to her home, but it would be hard to get a whole undergraduate education on that basis, wouldn't it? So there has to be a Biola University, there has to be an organization. And yet, unless there's religious freedom, Biola University could not do what it says it intends to do and exists to do, that is to offer a biblically-centered education, intentional spiritual development, and vocational preparation within a unique learning community where all faculty, staff, and students are professing Christians. Why does Biola need religious freedom? Well, at least in this way. Federal, state, and local laws say that employers cannot discriminate on the basis of religion when hiring staff, but Biola insists on hiring just professing Christians to join faculty and staff. It could hardly be a Christian university if it was required to ignore religion entirely when hiring faculty, professors, counselors, administrators, student activity coordinators, chapel staff, and all the other people that make it flourish. Fortunately, our employment law does protect religious freedom. It includes a religious freedom accommodation for religious organizations, allowing them to select for their staff only people who agree with and want to work in that environment. That creates a bit of a problem. If Biola University is legally free to hire only Christians, that means it's free to refuse to hire non-Christians. For example, Biola doesn't hire Muslims to be math professors, even if they're excellent math professors. It won't hire an atheist or an Orthodox Jew, a believer in Scientology, or a follower of EST, if that's still around. 
Isn't that discrimination, bigotry? Isn't that wrong? Excluding somebody because of their faith? Well, let's just step back a second. I've used this example before, and I'm not trying to pick on these people, but it's a good example. You know the animal rights organization, PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. I hope you believe in the ethical treatment of animals, although not necessarily the way that they do it. As a follower of all creation, we ought to respect all of creation. All right, so here's PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Are you interested in working there? Well, one of the first questions is, do you visit In-N-Out Burger once in a while or once a week? If you do eat burgers at In-N-Out Burger or some other place, you'll never be hired for various key positions at PETA. Check it out on their website. They say this, some of our positions do require you to be vegan. Which positions are those? Well, positions related to initiatives they take out in society, fundraising and development, and media spokespeople. So even if you love animals and want to protect them, and even if you have great communications or fundraising skills, if you love your burgers, don't even bother applying to PETA. For many of its key positions, you have to be vegan all day, every day. Is that bigotry? I don't think so. Just like Biola, PETA needs to be able to bring on staff only people who reflect its mission, embody it, who believe in it, who can represent the organization faithfully have a lifestyle that's consistent with the mission of the organization. That's just to say, in our diverse society, our, organi our organizations will be diverse and they have to be diverse. Not everybody's gonna be hired by every organization. Not every student wants to study at Biola, that's for sure, or at UCLA, that's also for sure. We shouldn't say that these organizations are bigoted just because they represent a particular faith or philosophy or point of view and I don't think we should use the law to pressure them to abandon their convictions and become just like every other organization. The law should accommodate their distinctive views and practices to give them religious freedom as it often does today. This is how we can have unity and diversity in our very diverse society, when the law incorporates religious freedom and allows private organizations to be distinctive. When that's the case, diverse job seekers can find compatible workplaces and students with different values can find appropriate educational institutions. But it is a case. The diversity of organizations does mean that we'll often encounter people and organizations with views and practices that we consider wrong, even profoundly wrong. But that's inherent in a diverse society with many different belief systems, identities, and practices. And just because some organization has a practice that you or I think is wrong is no good reason to ask the government to prohibit the organization from being true to its convictions. Holding strong different views does not equate to being a bigot who desires to harm other people. Take the sensitive question of marriage. Now, not the marriage issue you probably have in your mind. I'm thinking about a different one. My generation, the boomers, really messed up marriage. We messed it up by making it into a low commitment, easy exit relationship, as you know. The consequence was many divorces, many very complicated family relationships, much insecurity among many children and young adults and adults. And I can fully understand why many in your generation believe in a different concept of marriage. You believe that people should only get married if they're prepared for a long-term relationship that doesn't just fall apart. But let me ask you, does your different view about marriage faithfulness mean that you are a bigot and you must hate and wish to injure my generation because of our loose view of marriage? That doesn't make any sense, does it? You have a different conviction, which happens to be right. It would only become bigotry if you wouldn't let me rent an apartment from you because you think my beliefs are wrong about marriage or you refuse to me a bank loan because I'm one of those loser boomers. You and Biola don't need to agree with everyone else in the world in order to treat other people with respect and to give them their civil rights. That's that second great commandment. But treating others with respect and giving them their civil rights cannot mean that you have to change your views and practices to be the same as theirs, or that Biola has to try to be all things to all people. That's not even possible. That leads me to a second complication with religious freedom. Sometimes, as President Corey 
pointed out, religious freedom is put into practice, certainly in American history, in a one-sided way. And that's one reason why people don't trust it today. They say, you're just trying to get protection for your beliefs, you don't care about us. And that's been too often true with Christians in the United States. One-sidedness is a temptation for everyone, but we shouldn't give in to it. This one-sidedness was here at the start of the European settlement of America. Um, I'll leave aside here the other tragedies, of what we did with Native Americans, with African slaves, but just think about that religious freedom story. We've all heard about it. The pilgrims and others, they took the risky journey across the Atlantic Ocean to flee religious persecution and to come to a land of religious freedom where they could worship and live the way they thought God called them to worship and live. So Lutherans fled Catholic countries to come to America. Presbyterians fled Anglican England. Catholics fled Lutheran parts of Germany and so on. And sure enough, when they got to this continent, they each enjoyed religious freedom. Well, they enjoyed religious freedom if they landed in the right colony. Baptists in Anglican Virginia did not experience religious freedom. Quakers in Puritan Massachusetts did not experience religious freedom. Catholics in Protestant Georgia did not experience religious freedom. Almost all the colonies to start out with put, practice, put into practice a one-sided religious freedom. Freedom for our religion, which had been persecuted in Europe, but not freedom for your religion, not in my colony. It took a lot of debate and fierce argument and episodes of persecution even here in America before our forefathers and foremothers came to agree on the two-sided religious freedom that's in the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. That religious freedom in our First Amendment that it guarantees is religious freedom for everyone and not just for Christians or other favored religions. And we too must be careful to ask for religious freedom for all, not just for our own beliefs. Christians must stand up for the religious freedom claims of believers of other religions, also for our secular neighbors and their moral convictions. And I think we want the law appropriately to protect our fellow citizens who have different moral views about marriage and human sexuality and so on. Respecting other people does not mean changing your beliefs or Biola's mission and practices. We can respect others, though we deeply disagree with them. And we can ask the law to protect them, and not just ourselves, because we have confidence in God and his ways. Christians don't have to dominate society in order for the gospel to go forth. Pastor, uh, President Barry Corey said in his excellent book, Love Kindness, buy it in the bookstore. He said, in Jesus' way of kindness, we can be confident in our beliefs and also comfortable listening to those with different views. Anyone who lives this way of kindness, gospel kindness, will find a path to share the truth of God's will and grace as we see it in scripture. In other words, the gospel will go forth even though we don't force our beliefs on everyone, but treat them with respect. So remember these two great commandments, and when you read them, think about religious freedom. We have to love God totally and our neighbors as ourselves. To be obedient to both commandments, you and Biola may discover that you have to do things that the rest of our society thinks is wrong and harmful. Listen carefully. Maybe these things are harmful and we should stop. But if that's not the case, we must ask our neighbors and our government to give us religious freedom so that we can follow God and not society. But even as we ask for religious freedom for ourselves, let's remember to defend it for others. When we ask for our rights to be protected, let us also advocate for our neighbors' rights to be protected. In that way, we can put into practice both of the two great commandments, loving God fully and our neighbors as ourselves, being treated as we wish to be treated. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.